What has been happening around the world over the past week? I'm Shin Yun, and I'll take you through the top stories from Arirang here on our weekly news highlights. From this week, South Korea has banned short selling of stocks to ensure a level playing field for retail and institutional investors. Following the measure, the local stock market showed a large rise and fall to the point where financial regulators even had to activate a sidecar curb. For the first time since President Yoon suk yeol came into office, Washington's top diplomat Antony Blinken visited Seoul. The U.S. Secretary of State met with top officials from South Korea to address North Korea and Russia's alleged arms deal and military technology exchanges. South Korea has become the latest country to declare a war on bedbugs. The government has kicked off a four-week extermination campaign to eradicate these blood-sucking pests and to tame the public's jitters. We saw another surplus in Korea's current account in September. This is the fifth straight month we've seen favorable figures. Experts attributed this to lower oil prices and some recovery in chip exports. Our business correspondent Shin Ha-young tells us more. South Korea has managed to keep its current account in the black again in September. Preliminary data released by the Bank of Korea on Wednesday shows the country posted a current account surplus of 5.42 billion U.S. dollars. This is the fifth straight month that a surplus was recorded, and it was even greater than in the month before. The surplus growth comes on the back of a recovery in exports and lowered global oil prices compared to the same period last year. The goods balance, which tracks imports and exports, saw a surplus of $7.42 billion last month, recording a surplus for the sixth consecutive month. The country exported over $55.6 billion worth of goods, an on-year decrease of 2.4 percent and the 13th straight on-year decline. By items, shipments of semiconductors are still below last year's figure, but the drop has been slowing down. On the other hand, the drop in imports was greater than that of exports, as the cost of importing raw materials dropped due to lower energy prices. A rise in dividend income from Korean subsidiaries located overseas also contributed to the current account surplus. Meanwhile, the services account, which tracks earnings and spending on overseas trips and transport, suffered an extended loss of $3.2 billion. Despite successive surpluses, the total surplus from January to last month is only around $16.6 billion, which is about 65 percent of the level for the same period last year. The BOK forecasts that the current account will continue to maintain a surplus in October and in the fourth quarter overall as well. The surplus in the fourth quarter is expected to continue thanks to improvements in the semiconductor industry and strong car exports. But there's a chance the surplus may decrease compared to the third quarter due to uncertainties in oil prices and potential increases in energy imports for winter heating. He added that despite the uncertainties, the surplus for this year is expected to meet the bank's outlook of $27 billion. Shin ha Arirang News. With a better performance in exports, figures show that South Korea's economy is set for a mild recovery. But it is hard for everyday consumers to feel that way with soaring food prices. During this time of the year, a must-eat Korean street food is bungopbang. This is a fish-shaped pastry filled with sweet red bean paste. It's a popular street food thanks to its taste and price. One bungopbang used to cost around 77 cents. But now, with rising food and energy prices, we've seen the cost of pungopang nearly double. Vendors say they have no choice as ingredient prices have soared. For instance, domestic prices for red beans that are used to fill pungopang have jumped by 33 percent compared to last year. But the price hike comes as a shock to most Koreans who remember the good old days of enjoying a handful of pungopang for less than a dollar. Speaking of how burdensome it is for the regular consumer to even buy street food due to inflation, officials believe we may see food price increases stay above 5 percent for the third consecutive year. Authorities have vowed to take all possible measures to tackle the situation. Lee kyung reports. From fruits and vegetables to jam and cheese, the already high prices of food are rising even higher. I only wait for sales. Everyone is like me, waiting for sales flyers. According to Statistics Korea on Sunday, prices of food and beverages, excluding liquors for the period from January to October, were 5.1 percent higher than for the same period last year. By item, ginger was up 97 percent, carrots 34 percent, and jam, cheese and salad dressing 
all above 20 percent. Food prices briefly cooled in the summer, but food inflation is picking up again as rising oil prices push up the cost of processed food. And the remaining impact of the extreme summer weather still squeezes the supply of agricultural products. At this rate, the yearly inflation rate for food will stay above 5 percent for the third consecutive year, something unseen in the past decade. Meanwhile, prices of eating out also climbed by 6.4 percent on year. The lowest income bracket is hit hardest, as in the latest data from 2021, food expenses took a 44 percent of their spending, much higher than the 30 percent average. Authorities see prices stabilizing in the coming months, with the impact of the bad weather waning and through government efforts such as providing discounts and increasing supplies. The Agricultural Ministry is also set to run a task force to manage seven key food items including instant noodles, bread, snacks, coffee, sugar, milk, and ice cream. Young Eun, Arirang News. South Korea has put the brakes on the short selling of stocks from this Monday. This measure is most likely to last until June of next year, and watchers are now keeping a close eye on how this temporary ban could shape the market. For more, I have our economics correspondent Shin Ha-young joining me in the studio. Welcome, ha -young. Great to be here, ye -un. Now, ha -young, I'd like to dive into the first question. What exactly is short selling? Well, short selling is when investors trade with borrowed shares, and they do that in the hope that the price will fall later so they can buy back at a lower price and pocket the difference. For instance, if a stock valued at 100 US dollar per share is expected to decline, an investor can borrow the stock, sell it, and then repurchase it when the price drops to $60, making a $40 profit. And it's a very accepted and often useful tool for investors to make money and also for the market in terms of correction when the stock market or even individual stock prices are overvalued. It's a very accepted and often useful tool for investors to make money and also for the market in terms of correction when the stock market and even individual stock prices are overvalued. Hyo, this is the fourth time financial regulators have banned short selling stocks here in Korea. And referring to the circumstances in the past, what usually prompts the government or officials to do this? And what was different this time around? Well, um, regarding the recent ban, the Financial Services Commission cited illegal short selling activities by global investment banks amid growing uncertainties such as the Israel Hamas war. Amid global turmoil, we discovered illegal naked short selling by global investment banks and circumstances of additional illegal activities. It's a grave situation where illegal short selling undermines fair pricing of stocks and hurts market confidence. In fact, this is the fourth time that it's been prohibited. The first ban was back in 2008 during the global financial crisis, the second in 2011 during the European debt crisis, and the third during the COVID-19 pandemic. But this time, it's different from the previous cases. It was clear that in the past three cases, short selling was banned amid a sharp decline in stock prices. But the latest measure is aimed at institutional improvements rather than um, in response to a stock market crash. Then how did the temporary ban affect the stock market, particularly this week? Well, the very first day of trading after the announcement showed the country's benchmark Kospi Composite Index surging to its largest one-day rise in over three years. It rose by 5.66 percent and the tech-heavy cost stack increased by over 7 percent. And the gain was especially prominent in technology stocks with secondary battery shares of EcoPro BM and EcoPro. And the rise seen on Monday was also largely led by foreign investors. And this surge led to the activation of the Kostak sidecar limit, which mitigates volatility in stock markets and comes into play when the Kostak 150 futures fluctuate by more than 6% compared to the previous close. And this, however, didn't last. Over the next few days, stocks saw a consecutive decline as foreign investors turned into net sellers. The sidecar limit was activated once again on Tuesday, but for the exact opposite reason from the day before, to mitigate a drop. While the Costa closed down again on Thursday, the Kospi rose by 0.23 percent. And while some analysts say that this volatility is a result of foreign investors leaving the market, others say that it's more about the psychological effects of the ban on individual investors. Take a listen. 
I think the uh, market in rise in the first day was more psychological than real uh, because so many individual investors uh, had negative uh, feelings about the market from uh, the short selling. So we saw a very high increase on the first day. And as perhaps investors looked at a longer run uh, picture uh, more reasonably, they decided that the uh, prices are probably going to we settled to a lower level. So that's why uh, we saw the prices fall on the second day. Hyung, as you mentioned, we've seen fluctuations in the stock market, namely from foreign investors taking a different stance. And I think it has to do with banning short selling of stocks is quite unique in a local practice here in Korea. And I think that has to that could affect how uh, foreign investors actually commit to the market. Right. So why don't you now analyze how global markets have been reacting since Monday's measure? Well, according to Bloomberg, some observers say the complete ban makes the Korean market less um, transparent and therefore less attractive. The report added that the restriction may hinder Korea's chances of moving from an emerging market to a developed market. And Reuters also cited the uncertainty over short-selling regulation as one of the factors that need to be resolved for Morgan Stanley Capital International to upgrade South Korea's status. There are projections that it may be difficult to expect a boost in stock prices at short selling accounts for a tiny portion of the nation's stock market. And regarding the recent ban, Seoul's finance minister Chu Kyung woo said that it was a necessary measure for now and added that the government will continue with reform measures to win developed market status. I see. And as an economics correspondent, I think you can answer this million dollar question. What can we be looking forward to now from the market then? Well, the truth is this ban is temporary and the government is using this period to make improvements to the short selling system. In particular, it addressed the need to level the playing field between domestic retail investors and institutional and foreign investors. One expert points out the disadvantages individuals currently face in the stock market. Take a listen. The reason that current short selling system in Korea may be disadvantageous to individual investors uh, is that, for one thing, the institutional investors, both domestic and uh, foreign, uh, can borrow stocks for an extended period of time, but individual investors are limited to how much time they can borrow the stocks to engage in short selling. Meanwhile, there are concerns about the potential consequences of this unusual situation on the market in the future. The domestic short selling market is dominated largely by foreign investors, and as a result, it's likely to impact foreign investment in South Korean stocks. Take a listen. There's a possibility that as institutions and foreign investors are unable to short sell, they also won't be able to keep up the same proportion of going long and therefore damage the soundness of the financial market. Some experts believe that sparked by the recent ban, the momentum of short covery or buying back the borrowed shares in order to return them to the lender may have been exhausted. I guess we'll have to see how it plays out throughout the week and you'll be covering it as our economics correspondent. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. The top diplomats of South Korea and the U.S. have met here in Seoul to discuss how to better respond to the growing military cooperation between North Korea and Russia. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken made his first visit to South Korea in two and a half years and met with his South Korean counterpart Park Jin. In a joint press conference on Thursday, the two urged China to step in and play a constructive role in alleviating tensions. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pinzi with the details. Top diplomats of South Korea and the U.S. on Thursday called on China to play a constructive role in dealing with North Korea's deepening military ties with Russia. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who arrived in South Korea the day before, warned that the situation is very concerning, after holding a meeting with Seoul's Foreign Minister Park Jin. In a joint press conference, Blinken explained that the U.S. is seeing a two-way street when it comes to ties between Pyongyang and Moscow. We're seeing uh, the DPRK provide military equipment to Russia for pursuing its aggression against Ukraine, uh, but we're also seeing uh, Russia uh, provide uh, technology and support to the DPRK for its own uh, military programs. 
He also stressed the importance of China's role in pulling North Korea back from what he called the regime's irresponsible and dangerous behavior. China has um, a unique relationship with North Korea. As a result of that relationship, it has real influence. And we do look to China to use that influence to play a constructive role in pulling North Korea back from this irresponsible uh, and dangerous behavior. Seoul's foreign minister Park Jin also said it will not be beneficial to China's national interest if tensions in the East Asia region continue to escalate due to arms cooperation between Russia and North Korea. South Korea and the U.S. will work together to call on China to address concerns from neighboring countries as well as the international community so that it can play its role to make sure this kind of dangerous deal does not happen. Ahead of his meeting with Park, Blinken also met President Yoon over lunch. Yoon said now is a time when U.S. leadership is becoming increasingly important due to instability in the Middle East, along with the issue of North Korea and the war in Ukraine, and vowed to work closely with Washington. In response, Blinken said U.S. foreign policy remains focused on the Indo-Pacific region and that Washington intends to further strengthen its strategic partnership with Seoul. Peun Arirang News. Blinken's visit to Seoul came amid heightened tensions on the peninsula. Last week, North Korea designated November 18th as Missile Industry Day to commemorate a year since it test-fired its Hwasong-17 ICBM. South Korea's military remains alert as the regime could try another spy satellite launch attempt on that day. Once again, our Penzi has this story. The South Korean military says it's keeping an eye on a possible third attempt by North Korea to launch its military satellite on November 18th, which Pyongyang has designated as Missile Industry Day to commemorate last year's successful test launch of its Hwasong-17 ICBM. North Korea has designated so-called Industry Day several times before, so we are closely monitoring and tracking the situation, taking various possibilities into account, including a possible provocation on one of those anniversaries. The Joint Chiefs of Staff added that intelligence authorities of South Korea and the U.S. have been closely coordinating on the matter. Meanwhile, one expert noted that South Korea is also scheduled to send its own military spy satellite from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California with the help from Elon Musk's SpaceX on November 30th, and explained that this makes it risky for the North. If North Korea makes an attempt to send its satellite, whether it be on November 18th or any time up to November 30th, and it doesn't succeed, then they could very likely be upstaged by South Korea. But he added that North Korea will likely carry out a launch at some point, presumably before the end of the year. The North has failed twice in recent months to put a spy satellite into orbit. Immediately after it failed in its second attempt in August, Pyongyang announced that it would make a third attempt in October, but even into November still hasn't attempted a third launch. North Korea's satellite launch is seen as a disguised test of ballistic missile technology and is considered a violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. Peun Arirang News. The White House says Israel has agreed to pause military operations for four hours each day and open a second evacuation corridor from northern Gaza. This comes as Prime Minister Netanyahu once again says no ceasefire unless all the hostages are released. Che Soo reports. The White House has said Israel has agreed to make daily four-hour humanitarian pauses in northern Gaza to enable civilians to find safe areas. The pauses will start on Thursday. National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said Israel makes its own decisions, not the U.S., and there will be no military operations in the region during the pause. The Israeli military will announce each day's four-hour humanitarian pause and its location at least three hours in advance. Moreover, Kirby said Israel will open a coastal road as a second corridor for civilians heading south. According to the Israeli official on Thursday, after a first corridor along Gaza's main north-south highway was opened several times this week, more than 80,000 people used it to flee in northern Gaza. However, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has stated that the humanitarian pauses are not a ceasefire and they could only come with the release of all hostages taken by Hamas. There will be no ceasefire without the release of our hostages. Anything else is futile. 
On the same day, Israel Defense Forces spokesperson Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari uploaded on social media that Israel's ground operation is ongoing in the military quarter, the main base of Hamas inside Gaza City. The IDF said Israeli infantry and armored units entered the zone to destroy Hamas facilities, killing around 50 Hamas members. They found tunnels and weapons facilities and discovered Hamas military bases and command centers. Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said the IDF is developing new ways to enter or destroy tunnels without harming hostages, and the fighting will not stop until all hostages are rescued safely. Che Young, Arirang News. We're asking to call for a ceasefire. We need to stop the suffering that's happening in Gaza and all the children that have been, you know, they're dying and being massacred and butchered and stuff like that. Uh, we just want to call them just, just have a ceasefire and stop this madness. Many people are very concerned there's going to be, you know, a, a, you know, more violence because of this. A lot of people last night were like, "This, what is this going to start? There are violations by Hamas when they have human uh, shields. But uh, when one looks at the number of civilians that were killed with the military operations, there is something that is clearly wrong. These small insects have exploded into the spotlight. They're bedbugs, small wingless insects that are less than a centimeter in diameter and feast on human blood, often hiding in our beds, waiting to bite us at night. Widespread reports showed a major outbreak in cities such as Paris. The French capital is also worrying about the impact this infestation will have on its Olympics, which will start in less than a year. But bedbugs don't discriminate. We're now seeing an infestation scare break out here in Korea. Seoul had been practically bedbug free. It only had nine cases reported to the KDCA since 2014 following extermination campaigns. Because the country has had so few outbreaks in recent years, local companies are struggling to eliminate these pests. Public fears are mounting, driven by horror stories on social media. It's a race against time. That's why officials here are ramping up pest control measures. From this week, South Korea launched a four-week campaign to inspect and exterminate pests on public transport and in accommodation facilities. Iuni tells us more. South Korean authorities are fighting bedbugs amid growing public concern as the number of outbreaks as reported by the special response team on Monday surpassed 30. The first outbreak was reported in September, which was followed by reports in 17 regions across South Korea, including cities and provinces. Earlier in November, the Ministry of the Interior and Safety launched a special response to contain the growing bedbugs infestations. However, as the number of outbreaks increased, the matter was elevated to be overseen by the Prime Minister's office. A decision was made in the first related meeting held on Tuesday to intensify inspections and pest control starting Monday, focusing on public transportation and accommodation facilities for four weeks. In response to concerns about the effectiveness of currently approved bedbug pesticides available domestically, the government has decided to promptly import alternatives. And on the back of reports of bedbug infestations in France and the UK, demand for bedbug repellent in the local market has surged on year. According to reports on Monday, sales of bedbug repellent increased by 813% from the end of October to the 6th of November.
Sales of mattress vacuum cleaners also increased by 610%. In addition, demand for products like bedbug traps, which were not popular last year, has also increased. Bedbugs do not transmit disease. However, the bites from these blood-feeding insects can cause itching and lead to secondary skin infections due to scratching. Guidelines published by the government say that when bedbugs are discovered, the use of high-temperature steamers and repellents is effective. When bitten by bedbugs, it is advised to first wash the area with water and soap. A visit to the doctor may also be required, depending on symptoms. Authorities are also advising that travelers thoroughly disinfect luggage before storing for an extended period as a way to eradicate them. Before the latest bedbug outbreak in South Korea, only nine such reports have been submitted to the government since 2014. Lee Eun-hee, Arirang News. Another top news story to keep an eye on is President Yoon's visit to San Francisco to attend the summit of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. Arirang News will bring you the latest developments on the summit next week. Until then, that was our weekly news highlights. Thanks for watching and enjoy your weekend.